The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If you were thrilled about the just completed federal election, hold on to your hat. Already there are unmistakable signs that the provincial election campaign, theoretically more than half a year away, is already underway. Tonight we'll ask what this protracted election season might look like. Then the former head of the Federal Civil Service, Michael Wernick, is with us on his new book, offering advice for would-be power brokers in Ottawa and a peek behind the scenes for the rest of us. It's Tuesday, October 19th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. The Premier and top ministers are out making big announcements. The other party leaders are too. And of course, the campaign style ads have already begun. In case you hadn't stopped to calculate it, there are still 226 days until Ontario goes to the polls next June. With us now on what to expect in the months ahead, all in the provincial capital, and we'll introduce them in the order of their party standing in the House. Let's welcome, in the downtown core, Ginny Roth, progressive conservative strategist, national practice lead for the government relations firm Crestview Strategy. Kim Wright, NDP strategist and principal at Wright Strategies. In Midtown, Sumi Shan, vice chair of the 2022 Ontario Liberal Party campaign. She was the Liberals' candidate in Scarborough Rouge Park in 2018. And you can't do a show like this without an ink-stained wretch. And thankfully, in <laughs> Dufferin Grove, we've got Rob Ferguson, the Queen's Park reporter for the Toronto Star, joining us tonight as well. Great to see everybody. Thanks for coming aboard for uh, our program tonight. Let's start. We're just going to throw it right to the ads. I've been watching a lot of baseball lately, as has Fergie as well. And, uh, you know, one of the things you see a lot of in between innings are ads like this. Sheldon, roll it if you would. I hear it all the time. Politicians are famous for finding reasons to say no. That's not me. I'm Doug Ford, leader of the Ontario PCs, and we're the party saying yes. Yes to more opportunity, bringing more workers into skilled trades. Yes to building highways you can drive on so you don't sit in gridlock. Yes, to building homes more families can afford. We're the only party looking to the future, and we're ready to build. Now, that's obviously a, uh, if I can call it this, a feel-good ad, not an attack ad. But, Jenny, what's the thinking behind it? I think the thinking uh, is when you think about an election, the goal is to set a frame, right? And in a, in a dream world, as a political party, you want the other parties to step into your frame because then they're answering your question and you're the answer for voters to that question. And I think this job does a really good this ad does a really good job of setting that frame because we're already seeing the attacks on the PCs. So they get attacked for their MZOs, their ministerial orders to, um, to allow for new developments. They get attacked for trying to build a highway, Highway 413. Um, and by setting up this ad, he's saying, yeah, you can attack me for that, but I'm the premier that says yes. And I'm on the side of people who want those things, who want more housing, who want highways, who want to be able to get around the province. And so it almost preempts the attacks, I think, that will be laid against him. And it puts him in the driver's seat to, to drive that message himself uh, and make all of the other leaders in the, in the election campaign step into his, um, his territory and, and fight on his terms. So Kim, I, I think that's what it's trying to accomplish. And I think it does. Right. Kim, the uh, direct inference I suppose we're supposed to draw from this is if Doug Ford is the candidate of yes, that must make Andrea Horvath, the candidate of no. Are you concerned about that portrayal? Oh, absolutely not. And look, I love when people start to say, oh, they're attack ads, they're negative ads. No, they're contrast pieces. And the reality is that how Doug Ford has governed this province has not lived up to the hype. He talks about being the party of yes, uh, but he also is the party of slashing city councils, big footing over municipal decision making, uh, not actually building the amount of housing that uh, is frankly needed. And one doesn't need to just look in downtown Toronto, but in every every town and city in this province and there is a massive homelessness problem and there is a mental health problem and we're not getting to it let alone the fact that long-term care uh you know when I, my father was in long-term care it cost me more than my apartment in downtown toronto did to put him in long-term care every month and that wasn't a bells and whistles place it was 
you know, how do people afford that? So when I look at what Andrea Horvath and the New Democrats are bringing forward, it really is about how do you make people understand that there are consequences to what governments do and say, and those consequences have been coming home to roost. Um, you know, and so Doug can talk about the yes, but it's the question of what is he saying yes to and who is he saying yes to? Okay, we'll show an NDP spot in just a moment's time, but Sumi, let me get your take on that ad and whether or not you're concerned that, again, if Doug Ford is the candidate of yes, that means he'll try to portray you and your leader, Stephen Del Duca, as the party of no. Well, I think, uh, to Kim's point, what is Doug yes for? Is he yes for big box stores versus small businesses? Um, it was a yes for helping support the healthcare system when it was uh, was at the brink of collapse during uh, the recent couple of months. Um, so it's just a matter of like understanding what he is yes for. And what we've known is that he's been yes for repeatedly making mistakes, mishandling files, and, and saying yes to, to his special interests and holding powers versus supporting, uh, you know, vulnerable individuals or our education system, our healthcare system. I think that's important to, to contrast is that that he is yes for his, his being able to hold the power and to be able to uh, support his special interests versus the people of Ontario. Rob, maybe I could get you to explain why seven and a half months before the election is actually supposed to happen, we're starting to see so many ads all over television, radio, online, digital, on your Facebook pages, etc. Why is all this happening now? Yeah, I noticed them uh, all over the football games and baseball on the weekend as well, Steve. And and what we've got here is the new election spending ads or uh, rules. So um, once we get six months out from the election, then people, parties cannot do all this advertising in an unfettered manner. Right now, they can kind of spend as much as they want. So they're trying to, to get these ads out now to get a head start on, on painting the opponents. And I noticed that the NDP is out with ads, the PCs are out with the ads. The Liberals are not yet. Is that presumably because they don't have as much money as the other guys? Uh, they t I, I believe they're coming, and Stephen Del Duca, the leader, has said there, there won't be attack ads. We'll see how long that lasts uh, once we get into the campaign, because <laughs> this, this should be a wild one. Uh, and, you know, when, when Ford is doing these uh, uh, I'm, I'm the man of yes ads, I just think how much fun we can have with that, all the things he said <laughs> no to, like some of the, uh, like Sumi and Kim were saying, you know, he's, he was no to the... The higher minimum wage. He was uh, for a long time no to the to the paid sick days. Uh, you know those kinds of things that I think that ad actually. You know, despite what Ginny said, and I and I get their strategy there, but these these you know I'm the yes man ads do I think leave him open to some criticism that the other parties can can have some fun with, and so can all of us in the press gallery because we, you know, we're looking for answers and we want a yes. <laughs> well, we want, we want him to answer. I mean, uh, Jenny, that's not a bad point. The fact is, Doug Ford has said no to a lot of things. Sometimes he eventually gets to yes, but he often starts at no. You concerned about the opposition being able to portray him that way? I, I think they'll try, but I think that's the beauty of, of setting the narrative is that then people are fighting on your turf. And uh, over the next six months, I mean, it's really not a long time until voters go to the polls in the spring. It's got to happen June or earlier. I could see it happening earlier if we've got a budget that ends up being basically a campaign budget or a campaign document. Uh, and, and the party, uh, the PC party has way more money than the other guys do. Uh, and so they have an ability to reach people and reach them specifically about the commitments um, that the premier will make over the next six months. And there's all sorts of stuff that he's going to want to do that I think ideologically, the, ideologically the NDP and the Liberals won't. So I mean, Kim made the point about wanting to um, uh, fight with municipalities, but then also wanting to build housing. Well, you have to have a bit of a fight with municipalities in order to build housing, because the biggest impediment to housing in the province is municipal zoning restrictions. Uh, I think the premier is willing to have a bit of that fight. He's having it right now in Hamilton, and he knows that uh, public opinion is moving a bit. People finally want him to have that fight. There's a massive housing housing shortage. That's why it was such an issue, big issue in the federal election campaign. And so I think the PCs are looking forward to what people are going to be what's going to be top of mind in May or June when they vote. Uh, and he knows that uh, arguing about what happened two years ago is just not going to be that relevant to voters. Okay, since we're all in such a friendly mood today, we're not going to call these attack ads. We're going to call them, as Kim suggested, contrast ads. And here is the NDP attempting to contrast itself from the current premier. Sheldon, roll it if you would. 
This guy says he's for the little guy. But when workers need paid sick days, Doug denies them. When local businesses need help, Ford sides with big box stores instead. Doug Ford, here for his buddies, not for you. Kim, what's going on there? Look, it is exactly as it is uh, portrayed. It's pretty simple. You know, you can talk the talk about it's, uh, you know, he's all for the yes and all of these things. But paid sick leave is still a major issue. The lack of a, an agreement on child care uh, is appalling to me. The fact that, uh, you know, we are still finger pointing and still saying this isn't good enough and that's not good enough when people have to, before they even think about getting pregnant, have to sign up for daycare. So how do we deal with this? And, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, talk to any of the uh, parents of autistic children, uh, they certainly haven't been hearing a whole lot of yes. The the fact that there have been promises and then cuts and then cuts and then the comments of things like, eh, just give them an iPad, it'll be fine. That's not governing. Uh, so it, it really does boil down to that. So Andrea has making that contrast of, you know, he's, Doug Ford is here for his buddies, not for working families, not for people who are trying to have that better life in Ontario that we all want to see. Uh, and he is certainly no uh, no friend to, you know, the environment or to actually building housing. You know, ministerial zoning orders are well and swell, uh, but there's a lot of things that could have actually been done, and certainly with wraparound services and mental health support. So we see lots of ribbon cutting, and goodness knows we're going to see lots of ribbon cutting over the next six months. But it's what's actually being done. Can people actually get mental health supports, addiction supports, the counseling that they need? And especially coming out of this pandemic, people are expecting better because they've had a very different lived experience over the last two years. Sumi, how effective do you think that ad is? Um, I think to, to, to Kim's point, I, I don't believe it's effective at all. I think it allows us to be able to to argue that you know what he's been the yes man for 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 special interest and he's you know it's it's easy enough to do attack ads or as you say contrast ads when you have no plan and that's what we're seeing from uh from both the the, the tories and the ndps we're not seeing any plan to help the to the uh, the vulnerable or the ontarians as we're coming out of the pandemic what does that mean for our housing, what does that mean for our infrastructure, education, health care? There are so many things that we should be talking about, but instead we're we're attacking each other. I, I wonder if this is this is the leader that we want uh, going in um, as as we're coming out of of this pandemic. I think what the last couple of months have shown us is that we want a government that cares for us and is going to be able to act and to support us when we need it the most. And so far, we have not seen that. Rob, one of the reasons we wanted you on the program tonight is that we wanted somebody, uh, you know, quote unquote, who doesn't have a dog in the fight, who can tell us, uh, <laughs> you know, w how accurate these ads are. There are. A lot of allegations made in that ad. I mean, you've looked at it. How accurate do you think these charges are? Well, one of the one of the things that that Ford had a problem with in the in the first couple of go rounds, uh, uh, first couple of waves of the pandemic was was like that ad said, which was. You could still go to Walmart and get socks. You could go to Costco and get socks, but you couldn't go to, you know, Joe's menswear to get socks. So they they corrected that in the um, in the spring wave where they they did shut down those departments in Costco and Walmart. So you know that's I think that's going to be a lingering perception because we keep hearing uh, the business community. Uh, harping on that, and we saw a, a revisit to it just um, a week and a half ago, when, when on a Friday afternoon uh, at 4:30 on the eve of Thanksgiving, the government announced that, you know, stadiums, concert halls, you know, like the um, Scotia Bank Arena uh, for the Leafs and the Raptors could open to full capacity, and yet, for example restaurants are left at half capacity with really no explanation. So, you know, I, I see this news release come into my email box and I go, oh man, the restaurants are going to be super angry about this. And they were. And, you know, the, the government tried to dodge this by putting it out on late on a Friday afternoon by a long weekend. But, you know, it was uh, it was back on the on the front burner, like, uh, you know, so much uh, leftover turkey dinner in the microwave the whole following week. And then they had to do a scramble to uh, kind of do damage control. And now, supposedly later this week, we're gonna get a plan that tells what's gonna happen with restaurants and, and other venues like gyms that are still, and dance studios, whatnot, that are 
bowling alleys that are still limited to half capacity. So, yeah, I think that's that's still hanging. Jenny, I do need to ask you about that. And uh, I mean, let's hit it on the head here. The ad claims that Doug Ford is acting on behalf of bigger corporate interests uh, at the expense of the little guy who he purports to represent. Uh, he opened Scotiabank Arena for 20,000 people, but forces the restaurants only to half capacity. Uh, is, he, is, is he vulnerable on that charge? Well, don't forget, the for he ran as for the people the last time around. And I think the reason that worked is because the Fords, um, both he and his late brother, have this sort of cultural connection or perceived to, and I think it's genuine, with the working classes um, across Ontario. And uh, I think that lingers. I think that remains. There was, there's no doubt that there was a moment um, uh, in the premier's tenure where he had some really tough choices to make. Every elected official across the country did. Um, and you know, it comes down to uh, businesses who, you know, workers only have jobs if businesses can employ them. But workers are also consumers, um, and those consumers want to be able to get groceries uh, in the middle of a pandemic. They want to be able to have experiences and, and sort of go back to normal. And so balancing. Um, how to be for the people and how to be the guy who says yes and thinking about workers, not just as workers, but also consumers, uh, has been a challenge. And I think the premier's pivoting now back to, you can see, especially in his minister for labor, Monty McNaughton, a real effort to reconnect uh, with working people and, and prioritize what they care about. There's a package coming, I think, this week uh, from the minister of labor that is really going to seek to lean into uh, the take home pay and the benefits of workers across Ontario as uh, people struggle to rebuild coming out of COVID and rebuild their families uh, and their home lives. Um, and the economy, by all counts, is, is doing okay. I mean, there's actually a worker shortage right now. So people are, um, people are getting back to work, and that's a good thing. Uh, and I think the Premier is going gonna, is gonna to use that minister, Minister McNaughton, to reconnect with, with those people and remind them why he's for the people, as he so, did so well in the last election. Do you know what the slogan's going to be for the next campaign, incidentally? Well, I, I think I think the ad uh, that you that you played uh, off the top is is a good indicator um, that the PCs are the party of yes. I don't know if that'll be the slogan, but uh, it, it makes sense to me as as a coronary campaign. Gotcha. Now, here's one of the things that's been really unusual about some of the ads that are running right now. You can understand the NDP taking out ads against Doug Ford, his party's in government. They are the the big Kahuna that the NDP want to take down, but the NDP have also taken ads out against Stephen Del Duca, the Liberal leader. The Liberals have seven seats. They're in third place. Del Duca himself doesn't even have a seat. Let's give you a snippet of that, and we'll talk after this. Go ahead, Sheldon. But this guy thinks the job belongs to him. You might not remember his name, but she'll never forget his record as Kathleen Wynne's right-hand man, making big cuts and bad choices together, slashing health care and sending your hydro bill through the roof. Now he wants to be premier to do it all again. Stephen Del Duca, back for power, not for you. Kim, why would the NDP spend money going after third place instead of first place? So I think it's important that people remember what was that record. You, you know, sometimes people look back nostalgically and maybe it wasn't so bad with these people. And ultimately, uh, you know, when we start to see where people uh, still are and they're still very concerned about the Liberals being much more rhetoric than actual reality, uh, they certainly cut a lot of things and they didn't live up to the hype of their promises because really they, their hearts were never in into supporting uh, a guaranteed basic income. They were never uh, going to do actual reform on uh, on long-term care because they had 15 years and never got it done. So there's lots of people who want to say, oh, but wouldn't it be great if we just went back to that those liberal governments? But the reality was that no, those weren't actually benefiting people. And, you know, uh, there's a liberal strategist, Omar Khan, who actually in the dying days of the last election said, oh, actually, Andrea Horvath is the problem. Problem. Doug Ford's going to be great for Ontario. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of things that it's important for people to remember about those 15 years under the Liberal government. And Stephen Del Duca will try to say, but we need to look forward, not back. But he also was not only a, a senior cabinet minister on transportation that frankly wasn't getting delivered, uh, especially around the GTHA, but he was also a backroom hack for 30 years, a strategist for Kathleen Wynne. So it is actually uh, a valid point to say, 
right hand man, the strategist, the guy behind the curtains before he got to be the guy making decisions. And his decision making is questionable at best. Kim, so we, we got to do a little fact check here. We got to do a little fact check here. Stephen Del Duke, I think, is 46 years old. So he can't be a backroom hack for 30 years. That would have started oh. him at 16. Oh, he, in fact, talked the other day about, uh, in his speech, about how he was starting in campaigns and in politics for 30 years and worked his way up and has been doing the job, certainly, uh, quite I don't think he called time. himself a backroom hack, though. Oh, I'm certain he would never call himself a backroom <laughs> hack, but he was certainly on the senior leadership campaigns for, the, for all of the McGinty years and prior to that. So, yeah, it is actually quite accurate to say Stephen Del Raduca has been an architect for the bad campaigns and the bad governing for quite some time. Okay, Sumi, so let me get to you on this point, and that is that obviously the NDP and the Conservatives are running the same kind of ads against Del Duca. They're trying to basically frame him before he gets a chance to define who he is himself to the people of Ontario because he's the least well-known of all the leaders. And I wonder, you know, this is a tried, tested, and true program that works. Just ask Michael Ignatiev. You guys worried about this? No, I think, you know, uh, uh, what is that saying that um, the worst thing about being talked about is not being talked about at all? And, you know, it shows that both the parties are are afraid of what the Liberal Party stands for, what our, our leader and our team is, will be able to, to, to do for Ontario. We've done a lot um, in, in the past, and, you know, I, I think... Uh, Jenny mentioned it. Not all leaders get it right, you know, all the time. But you know, for the most part, well, what the Ontario Liberal Party has done for for Ontario and its citizens, I think, can certainly hold to test uh, in comparison to the NDP, who have had a leader for 15 years, hasn't like recently only on the last election has squeezed into into opposition, uh, and that was because you know the uh, Ontario Liberal Party, uh, unfortunately, um, wasn't able to, uh, to 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 make government or opposition so it, it really shows are they able to 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 be able to make the next government and be able to support Ontario I don't think so I think Stephen Del Duca uh, as a leader knows the people of Ontario has supported um, government and we've we've done a lot over the last uh, years when it comes to coming out of the recessions uh, you know pulling back all of the the decimation from the Harris days uh, you know it took a long time to be able to get back Ontario on a good footing we gave Ontario on a good fitting to the Tories. And, you know, what happened? We've, we've lagged behind when it comes to health care, to education. We're, we are the party that's moving forward. And, and, and attack ads and, and all of this is just shows of desperation. They don't have a plan. Therefore, they're looking to attack uh, to our party leader. And I just think that shows you exactly who they are. Ginny, I guess I'd ask you the same kind of question I asked Kim, uh, because you guys are running the same kind of ads. Uh, t trying to tie Stephen Del Duca to Kathleen Wynne. And I guess the question is, do you think it's still good politics in 2021, 2022 to keep bringing Kathleen Wynne's name up, given that she's not going to be on the ballot in the next election? Well, the last election wasn't that long ago. I mean, I think Simi said um, that, that they gave on Ontario to the PCs in great shape. Well, they didn't give the <laughs> Ontario to the PCs. Uh, Ontarians were very clear that they were done with the Liberals uh, a few years ago. And they, it wasn't, you know, things were not uh, in good stead. I mean, energy prices were out of control. People couldn't afford their hydro bills. Uh, they were fed up with, um, with all sorts of uh, things about, you know, after a decade of Liberal government. Uh, they were sick of it. Now, the liberal brand, I think I think part of why you see these attacks on Del Duca is because the liberal brand um, isn't as weak. Uh, the liberal brand federally is obviously quite strong in Ontario still. Um, and, you know, people as a centrist party, the liberals, I think, can benefit from that. But one of the worst jobs in politics is being leader of the opposition. I think it's even worse to be <laughs> leader of the third party because it's really hard to get attention. Uh, Fergie and his gallery, you know, make their best effort, but it's really hard to cut through on provincial politics and the Canadian news. And as a third party leader, it's really, really hard to get attention. And so what happens is voters don't pay attention to you or notice you until uh, the rip period, until those days of an election campaign. And, um, you know, the Del Duca team is going to want to make sure that he is popular when he's finally turned to. And uh, if the NDP and the PCs keep hammering him uh, and his brand and tying him to win, who we know is very unpopular um, over these next six months, I don't think that bodes well for how Ontarians will view him when they finally start paying attention. Well, OK, again, Rob, we need you here for truth and advertising. Mm -hmm. Both of the ads by the NDP <laughs> and the progressive conservatives uh, are calling Stephen Del Duca Kathleen Wynne's former right-hand man. Is that true? 
Mm -hmm. uh, no, I kind of laugh at that because I think that's uh, quite a bit of flattery, maybe uh, unintended flattery for Stephen Del Duca. He was mostly transportation minister during that time. He wasn't that that big a figure, uh, so they're 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 trying to, you know, pump him up uh, for for their own purposes. There, I'm not sure how well that's going to go because people might be saying, "Well, I, I don't even know really who Stephen Del Duca." is so how could he have been kathleen Wynne's right hand man i want to now have a little bit of a discussion about something premier ford said last week which i've kind of never heard a politician say before the premier said quote the worst place you can give your money is to the government it doesn't matter if it's municipal provincial or federal jenny how should we interpret that well, I think, you know, we can always go back to the Ford family brand is strong. And I think the premier, one of the premier strengths is that he knows he has sort of a gut instinct about how people feel about government and how they want government to intervene in their lives. They appreciate services. They appreciate things that only government can build, like highways and transit and all the things that he wants to say yes to. But at the end of the day, they don't want to be tapped into oblivion. I mean, his brother learned this by talking about the gravy train um, at the city of Toronto. And I think that remains. Uh, and don't forget, as these issues progress on the provincial landscape, there are a lot of things going on. There is inflation that appears to be potentially uh, going to be sticking around a lot longer than people realize. The cost of living is going up. And I think people are going to become very, very, very sensitive to any kind of new tax or fee. And we know that when parties of the left are given power, um, they want to find a way to fund their promises. And they are more comfortable with taxing people than, than uh, certainly uh, Doug Ford is. And so he wants to remind people that he reduced um, their their cost of living, and he wants to remind them, I think, that other parties would, would intervene um, and, and take more money out of their pockets if they were able, able to get power back. Kim, what did you think when you heard the Premier say that? That he still fundamentally doesn't understand the value of government and the value of supporting Ontarians. Uh, look, this is a big province. It takes a lot of money to run, but there's also a lot of uh, situations that are can be can be recalibrated. Certainly, healthcare can be recalibrated, but it has to be recalibrated in a way where people actually can access services. And I'll tell you, you know, I grew up as a border kid outside of Windsor. Uh, you didn't have to look very far to understand how quickly you could become homeless uh, by just having to go to the hospital. Those are not the things we want to see. But the co the corollary of that is that. There are lots of services we do need to support people uh, on, making sure that not only do you get to go to the doctor, but that, oh, wait, the prescriptions they write you, you can take. So being able to afford those things. People are understanding much more, especially in the last two years, the value of what governments can do, can be a part of, where they can be a force for good and for change, uh, and frankly, where they can come up short. And what I what I know about Andrea Horvath, and I know like people like to talk a lot about, oh, this is her you know, third or fourth kick at the can. Fourth. The reality is she continues to grow. She continues to resonate with people. And what we're also seeing is that people are taking a look at her post-pandemic and go, okay, I now get the, where the value of gover governments are, where we can support our communities. And they're looking at her as potential premier, not just that steel town scrapper that we know and love, but what can she do? What can she bring to the table? And what's the team around her that can really make Ontario better? So look, uh, I, I know, Steve, you're a fan of Bill Davis and, some, and, and also of Sean Conway. Sometimes people hanging around for a while actually does benefit uh, the people that uh, we are serving. It is public service. And that's what I see from the Horvath campaign. And my goodness, I've never seen as much of a fire in her belly in the entire time that I have known her that I've seen in the last year with her. Sumi, what was your view when you heard the Premier say the worst place you can send any money is to a government? Well, I think it's, it's missing the point that, you know, I think people are suffering, Ontarians are, are, are struggling, and we need a government that is able to understand that and to be able to support the, uh, support our Ontarians, whether it's providing living wages, uh, you know, to, to keep up with inflation or, or restructuring our healthcare system to, to support all of the long-term long -term care or, um, you know, ensuring that we've got the, the right infrastructure for, for our education system when with, with 
um, students going back into schools with the pandemic. Uh, you know, we're looking for a government that understands and is empathetic. And that's, I think, what you'll get from the Ontario Liberal Party and its leader and its team. Um, you know, we're looking at $10 a day childcare and understanding that the impact that childcare has on our, our working class families. Uh, you, you know, a four day work week. We've understood what the pandemic has, has meant for, for um, Ontarians. Over 130,000, um, you know, uh, employees in Ontario have chosen family over work and that we need to ensure that our working systems are able to. Uh, to recalibrate itself to understand the new normal, and we need a we need a government and a and a leader that understands that you know just keeping the the, the money in the bank is not at all. We it, government is meant to support our Ontarians to ensure that they have the right services and infrastructure to be able to move forward with their lives. And we need and in order to do that, we need to be able to fund it. Rob, you've covered politics for uh, a couple two three years. You ever heard a, a premier <laughs> before say the worst place you can send your money is to a government? I've never heard that, and I always thought the best place to send your money was to subscribe to the Star or donate to TVO. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I know that that's kind of an odd thing for him to say. I think at this time, when uh, as uh, I think Kim was mentioning, or maybe it was Sumi, that, that you know we've learned the value of government in this pandemic. And in fact, you know, uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, the PCs were going to uh, cut back on, on on public health and had to reverse that. So. You know, here we are, and I think in the election in the spring, people are going to be looking for who, who do they think uh, is is best placed to to uh, lead Ontario out of this, and and you know, paint a new vision for what the province can be post pandemic. Hopefully, you know, we don't get a new variant that's evasive of vaccines, and hopefully, we're out of this you know elastic waistband work at home phase uh, <laughs> by the time the election rolls around next June. Ginny, I'm down to my last couple of minutes, and I, I just want to try this one more time because uh, I appreciate that the Premier has this keep taxes as low as possible brand that he needs to burnish. I get that. But I wonder whether the comment displayed a kind of an ignorance about the fact that if people don't send any money to the Treasury, hospitals don't stay open, roads don't get paved, subways don't get built, I mean, et cetera, PPE doesn't get purchased, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do, do you think he understands that? Well, I, I think it would be impossible for a premier who's invested billions. I mean, uh, we can talk about the size of the deficit, and I'm not I'm not bragging about the size of the, de the deficit or the government's debt, uh, of course. But to think that somehow um, this commentary means that this is an austerity premier, an austerity government, I think flies in the face of the massive amounts of investments uh, that they've made into healthcare, especially, uh, but government services across the board these last number of years. This is not um, an ideological premier. He is not an ideological conservative who wants to slash and burn. In fact, he's invested billions as a government uh, across the board. But he is a sort of grassroots populist guy at the end of the day. And he knows how the average voter feels, which is, yes, I want my health care. I want child care. I want a strong education system, all of those things. And I think the government will prioritize those things going into the election. But they also do, they also need to be able to afford to live. And the cost of living is going up and the last thing they want is a new fee or a new tax. They don't care what level of government it comes from. They just know they can't afford it. They can't afford hydro rates um, uh, when, they, when they need to heat their homes. They can't afford the cost of groceries going up. Um, they can't afford any of it. And and for them, I don't think they care um, where, they're, where they're spending their money. If it means, if there's a new cost uh, to their lives that's going to make things more expensive, it, it, to, to Kim's point, it might make the difference between um, uh, uh, being in poverty or being out of it. And so I think in those moments, the premier is connecting with people in a way that a lot of politicians aren't able to do. Our thanks to Ginny Roth, Kim Wright, Sumi Shan, and Rob Ferguson for joining us on TVO tonight. To be continued, friends, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Many Canadians might be hard-pressed to know what it means to be the clerk of the Privy Council. Well, Michael Wernick had that job, and his new book does much more than explain that the clerk is the top job in the federal civil service. The book is called Governing Canada, a guide to the tradecraft of politics. Michael Wernick spent almost four decades in Canada's public service, working at the highest levels with three different prime ministers, and he joins us now from the nation's capital for this insider's view. Michael Wernick, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How are you doing? 
Thanks for inviting me. Not at all. How would you characterize, let's start very generally here, how would you characterize what the role of a prime minister ideally should be? Well, as I go through um, in the book um, a, a little bit of what prime ministers do all day and what ministers do all day, um, I, I do unpack that a little bit, so I don't want to give away everything that's in the book, Steve. But um, it's a job that involves wearing several hats. Uh, the one that I focus on the most is chairing cabinet. Um, you are the prime, you're the first minister, uh, it's your cabinet, and driving the process of cabinet to take decisions um, on behalf of all of us uh, is really one of the, the, the things that I focus on. But there are other aspects to being the prime minister, your first minister in the federation, dealing with premiers and other levels of government. You're the head of uh, government for Canada, and a lot of a prime minister's time is involved in international relationships with other leaders and international organizations. You're the chair of your caucus, and uh, what prime ministers often do is uh, tend to their team. Uh, they have 100 or more MPs, and uh, there's a lot of caucus relations in bringing that team along and developing it. Um, so, you know, there, there are different aspects to being a prime minister. Um, you, you're overextended from the, the day you start to the day you leave, and uh, the mindful management of your time is, is really one of the key skills. I want to follow up on one word that you just used there that I note over the years political people use, but if I can use this expression, don't take it the wrong way, but normal people don't talk this way. You said politicians, or the prime minister in particular, takes a decision as opposed to makes a decision, which is, I think, what the rest of us do. Why is there that distinction in politics? Uh, it's just Ottawa vocabulary that I've been steeped in. I'm, I'm not, it may be a distinction without a difference. Um, but um, I mean, I think it does go to the point that uh, the purpose of governing is to make or take decisions on our behalf. Uh, these are the people, 38 million of us, and we give about 35 of them uh, in cabinet and about uh, 338 of them in parliament a mandate to decide on uh, legislation, policies, regulations, negotiations, and so on. And uh, it's not there to be a campus debating club uh, um, or somebody's perfect uh, model of, of government. It's there to take decisions and advance the country. Okay, let me get back on the path here. And that is, again, based on your experience, ideally, do we want a prime minister who sort of rolls up their sleeves and runs departments and really has the hand on the tiller? Or is it preferable to have a prime minister who is more kind of a mouthpiece for the government and sort of conveys an impression of the kind of government he or she wants to run? Well, I think the government, the, the face of the government is always the prime minister. It is the focal point of accountability and question period. It's the one recognizable name for most voters. Uh, you are the brand, the reputation, the image, and the most effective spokesperson for the government. And that's a lot of what prime ministers have to be good at. What I try to shed light on in the book is that uh, apart from those two minute clips on question period that you might see on the news every night, prime ministers are very busy doing other things. And uh, you know, moving things through cabinet government is uh, one of the important ones. It, it takes place away from the cameras, away from the spotlight, uh, but it's fundamentally important to our democracy. One of the things you wrote that surprised me a little bit was that you said prime ministers ought to be feared from time to time by their cabinet ministers. How come? I think well, that's probably true of corporate CEOs and the heads of law firms and so on, is that you, uh, I think uh, to, to move a team along, uh, you want to feel that there are consequences for underperformance or poor behavior um, and that there will be sanctions. So um, I think it's important to be liked and respected and you know to run a team effectively but I think uh, you want other people to worry a little bit about what you think about them. How common a phenomenon is it that the longer a prime minister is in office, the more he or she surrounds him or herself with sycophants and or yes people who tell them what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear? I think it's a risk um, that you, you're in a comfort zone of people that you trust and you're used to working with. And there will, what I say in the book is that your default will be to stay with the same circle probably longer than you should. But um, you and I know some of the political history and previous prime ministers have made substantial changes. Uh, prime Minister Harper went through several chiefs of staff and uh, many, many members of his inner team. Uh, certainly, uh, Brian Mulroney did. He didn't. Uh, he didn't finish with the staff that he started with, Pierre Trudeau, and so on. So, uh, I think uh, 
what what I what I suggest is that once in a while you pause and take a look at um, both um, the processes that you're using and the people that you're working with, and just uh, mindfully think about it uh, from time to time. Uh, because each mandate is going to present uh, new challenges in a new context. The late, great Bill Davis used to say, and in fact, he told this to Brian Mulroney when Mr. Mulroney was in deep trouble. He said, the people who get you there are not the people who will keep you there. You find that to be the case? Well, I certainly make the distinction that the people that are good at winning elections are not necessarily going to transfer in and be um, as effective at governing. Uh, there are people who are uh, very good at the business of elections. Um, some of them come into government and, and find themselves in the prime minister's office or the offices of cabinet ministers. A lot of them do take to governing, um, but some of them don't. So it's, it's, uh, I, I do want to draw a line between the skill set of winning elections, which I know nothing about, and the skill set of governing and, and getting decisions on behalf of the country. Okay, let me put you in a really squeamish position right now, which is to say the current prime minister has had the same chief of staff since day one, and he's now in year six. Should he be thinking about changing that position? He should be thinking about what team he wants to use in his third mandate, and that, and that goes all the way through the team. Does that mean he should change Katie Telford? I, I, that's really up to the prime minister. Yes, it is. All right, let's talk about politics and partisanship here. And I want to ask you about, and I know you get asked this all the time, about the uh, independence of the civil service. Because, of course, uh, there was that moment in 2015 when Justin Trudeau first became prime minister and he went to the um, Foreign Affairs Building, the Pearson Building, and, I mean, he got rock star treatment from public servants who are supposedly neutral. They cheered for him, they hugged him, they did selfies with him and all that kind of thing. How concerned were you that that kind of situation confirms what too many people already believe, which is that public servants prefer to have the Liberals in and the Conservatives out? Uh, I found that those scenes really unfortunate and, and dismaying. I know where they came from. It came from the tone more than anything of the last few years of the previous government, more than the substance. Um, and the tone that ministers and their offices project to the public service has an impact on, on people's morale and energy and, and dedication. That doesn't make them partisan. Um, I worked uh, about equally for Team Red and Team Blue. And uh, you know, public servants come in um, and work really hard to deliver services and programs that the government of the day has a mandate for. Uh, and it was important that, um, and it remains important that uh, when there is a change of government, that uh, you know the incoming group feels that the public service is there to give them advice and support and help them um, deliver the mandate that they put to Canadians. And so, uh, I was very pleased in 2015 that we went from uh, Team Blue to Team Red in 16 calendar days with very little loss of traction. Let me ask you about the things that get governments into trouble. And uh, you having been there uh, in the public service for nearly four decades, uh, would have seen the kind of thing that trips politicians up. What does it tend to be? Behavior. Um, it's usually not a policy issue. It's not uh, you know, bringing in some unpopular program or law or, or policy. That certainly can happen. Uh, and it's not always, um, you know, scandal. It's it's just a question of projecting uh, being out of touch, projecting being careless with public money uh, is particularly, uh, you know, corrosive. Um, any kind of sort of being arrogant or feeling entitled to the job uh, can be uh, be a problem. But um, and we've obviously seen, and, and this is not just in politics, but in in in, in other sectors. Uh, behavior, like you know, personal conduct, harassment, bullying uh, in the workplace, the way you get along with other people is really important. So, um, it's basically uh, you know a profession of people. And uh, what I've seen over the years in terms of you know which careers flourish and which ones don't, it's almost always about uh, behavior. Do you think one party suffers from it more than the other? No, I think the only real difference between parties is, you know, from my perspective, is the ones that are in and the ones that are out. Um, uh, being in government brings with it certain, you know, constraints and temptations, and uh, being in opposition does too, and, and that, that's really the fundamental difference. Bob Ray said that to me once. He said, we, we really overdo the analysis when we talk about liberals versus conservatives. It's really ins versus outs. The outs want to get in, the ins want to stay in, and that really motivates everything. You think there's something to that? 
I think that's a, a principal driver, and that's democratic politics. Uh, governments want to remain in office so they can do the things that governments get to do. Um, as I say uh, you know, in the book, sometimes the point of winning elections is to be able to govern. Uh, you know, and if you get to govern two or three mandates, you bend the curve of history. Um, I, a lot of the media coverage focuses on whether a particular law or policy or decision is popular or will bring you up or down in the polls and win the next election. But from my point of view, the point of winning elections is to be able to govern. Let me pull a quote from the book here. You wrote, any whiff of it, criminality in government, is very exciting and is likely to generate a frenzy. You say you can't make use of a government aircraft or a, char a chartered aircraft without bringing down scorn or theatrical outrage. Is it your belief that government watchdogs and journalists often overhype or, I, I guess, sex up scandals that are really non-events at the end of the day? No, I think uh, I want to be really well understood on this. A vigilant uh, media and press and opposition and the, the institutional watchdogs, as, you know, as, as we call them, are really important to effective government. Uh, they shed a light on, on things and uh, force governments of, of all stripes to, to strive to do better. So we as Canadians are well served uh, you know, by having that accountability and feedback loop. The point I was trying to make is that um, Canada is actually uh, very well governed. Uh, if you look at any international index of transparency or corruption or uh, effectiveness on, on all kinds of scales, I'd be happy to recite them for you. Canada has a very strong public sector, both at the federal and the provincial and municipal levels. Um, and these transgressions that you do see in, in, in other countries of outright sort of nepotism and fraud and criminality and interference, uh, you know, in the judiciary, they just don't happen in Canada. Uh, and so even an, a whiff of it or an allegation of it is obviously a very serious matter. And, and I totally understand why uh, they immediately, you know, uh, create something of a feeding frenzy in the media. And, and I'm not critical of that. I'm just saying if you're a minister, you, you need to be very mindful of that and uh, behave, uh, you know, behave uh, correctly at all times. Now, what you just said is an empirically provable fact. If you go to Transparency International, you will find Canada very high up on the list. But we actually dropped a few places on the list last year because of three letters, SNC which actually don't appear in your book. And I wonder why not. Well, I don't talk about any specific incidents in the book. It's, it's a photo mosaic of uh, governing over several years. Uh, you know, over, I worked closely uh, with four prime ministers, the three prime ministers, and I got to see another one up close. Uh, I was a deputy to several ministers. So what I'm trying to do is get a composite picture of how cabinet governments and shed light on the how uh, as one of the reviewers of the book said, it's not a tell-all, um, it's a how-to. And uh, I think I'm in a unique position because of my cumulative experience, uh, you know, to talk about the trade craft and, and uh, what do these people actually do all day on our behalf. You are. And it's so rare for us to have uh, somebody who's had your job on this program that I'm going to take advantage of it right now. And I'm not <laughs> going to rehash the whole SNC-Lavalin thing again. Um, but, but we've had Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former Attorney General, on this program a couple of times uh, talking about the set of circumstances that ultimately led to her leaving politics and you leaving your job as the clerk. So let me just play a little snippet here of what she had to say in one of her previous appearances here, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. It was my job to protect the government and to protect the prime minister from wrongdoing in terms of interfering with a prosecution. I would expect that any leader would look to their attorney general to do exactly the same thing. And certainly in terms of being a team, um, I uh, want to be on teams where people hold true to their values and principles, have integrity and speak up when something is wrong. And um, I will never ascribe to a politics where there is an assumption that being on a team or doing your job is doing what you're told um, by unelected people. What do you make of how she has interpreted her mission as a cabinet minister? Um, it, it's, uh, I, I really don't want to get into it. She said, he said with Ms. Ray, 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 Ray Wilson, maybe some other time. 
Um, I think as a member of cabinet, you're in a unique position to have influence and to speak up. There are multiple, multiple opportunities. You're at caucus every week, you're at cabinet, you're at cabinet committees, you're sitting in question period, you're in the government lobby, you have access to the prime minister, to other cabinet ministers. As I said at the committee, you can pick up the phone, call the PMO switchboard and connect with anybody and say, you know, I need to speak to you about something. Um, so I've always wondered why, um, you know, uh, the minister just didn't take up that opportunity. She had many, many opportunities to speak up if she was concerned, uh, and she didn't do so. Uh, the matter was never raised at cabinet uh, other than two bookends, um, you know, the, the deferred prosecution agreements, which are an entirely lawful thing for the minister to consider, were added to the criminal code on the recommendation and signature of that minister. And she spoke in favor of it cabinet and it became part of Canadian law. And the next time the matter ever came up inside the cabinet room was after she had left as a minister. She did feel you inappropriately pressured her to side with the prime minister on this issue. Do you think that's an accurate characterization of your conduct? Inappropriate is, uh, you know, up to people like the ethics commissioner and, and others to judge. I am uh, very comfortable that I was doing my best to do my job and in fact, uh, one of the things that I said uh, at the committee, and, and I would repeat, is, is that uh, people are trying to oversimplify what was going on. It is entirely possible to, to, to believe that I was trying to do the right thing, the minister was trying to do the right thing, uh, her chief of staff was trying to do the right thing, PMO was trying to do the right thing, and, and uh, it just led to the, the set of circumstances that it did. Let me ask you one last thing on this and then we'll move on. She secretly taped your phone call. What did you think of that? Well, uh, what's important is what the rest of cabinet thought of that and what the Liberal caucus thought of that. Um, I, I think it was an uh, improper thing for a minister to do. I think it was an improper thing for a lawyer to do. And it certainly was a violation of trust in a personal relationship with her that goes, in my case, goes back to 2006. Ever spoken to her since all that? No. Okay, moving on. Um, this is a particularly... Um, tempestuous time in our political history. And you uh, garnered a lot of headlines um, a, a couple of years ago when you appeared before a parliamentary committee and you expressed a lot of concern that, quote, someone's going to be shot in this country during a political campaign. And, I mean, sure enough, last week, a British member of parliament named Sir David Amos was stabbed to death at a constituency meeting. And I guess my question is, uh, have you seen anything in the last several months that has made you less concerned about the nature of politics in this country today? Well, I spoke up on the issue the day after the Yellow Vests uh, rally in which people were walking around with signs, you know, uh, about treason and traitor and the rhetoric was starting to bubble up. And we'd seen what had happened in France with the Yellow Vests and so on. So. And I had access at the time to intelligence and police reports and uh, I knew what, uh, you know, what was happening. Uh, I knew some of the abuse, uh, the vile things that were being sent to ministers, particularly to the women and people of color, to political staffers, you know, videos on how to commit suicide, you know, racist, homophobic and misogynist sort of uh, stuff. And the theory at the time was, well, let's not talk about it because it'll just encourage copy, copycats. And I just felt uh, you know, I, I needed to call it out at the time. Um, you know, since I left, I don't have access to that flow of information. I've talked to a few politicians. Um, they have spoken up on it and uh, it's spread uh, you know, to, to, uh, to people in, in, in other parties. It happens in other countries. So uh, what I talk about in the book is um, there will be a price for this in the sense that um, I would think twice about coming into public life, uh, you know, because of this and, and certainly getting people to stay uh, in public life. Um, so, you know, over a course of years, uh, there's going to be adverse selection and uh, that's, that's not going to be good for our democracy. When in the last federal election campaign, you saw somebody pitch a handful of gravel at the prime minister when he was on the hustings, uh, what went through your mind at that moment? I was thinking that the, you know, the personal protection detail uh, would be con extremely concerned because if you can reach somebody with gravel, you can reach them with other things. And uh, I think that the, uh, not just the prime minister, but ministers and as we're learning, constituency MPs are uh, putting themselves in harm's way. 
it's just a reality that uh, you know uh, people are going to have to be very concerned about physical security of, of premises and buildings and vehicles and, and uh, mindful of this um, uh, you know going forward. Um, what people see less of is is the vile things that happen on uh, in cyberspace and the kind of uh, just outrated uh, hate speech and abuse and bullying that goes on every single day. Well, let's finish up on this. Do you think simply by doing their jobs? the way that they think they need to do their jobs, and obviously that involves a great deal of interaction with the public, do you think our politicians are putting themselves in needless danger? I wouldn't say needless. I think it just is now part of the compact of, uh, of going into public life. And uh, just to be smart about it, uh, you do get briefings on personal safety and security. This happens in private sector and diplomats and people that go into other jobs. Uh, I just think... Um, uh, is something, you know, my advice to to a new minister is listen carefully to the security briefings and uh, take them seriously. And just finally for you, is there life after being the clerk? Of course. <laughs> uh, like like uh, all Canadians, uh, life was disrupted by a global pandemic. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I've been doing uh, some teaching, some writing, some consulting, and uh, trying to pass on some of that experience. And uh, I hope the book is is an effective way. I wrote it mostly for uh, students of political science and uh, public management, uh, politics courses, uh, and they keep growing new ones. So hopefully the book will have a bit of a uh, bit of a shelf life. But uh, anybody who uh, wants to take a bit of interest in uh, how our unique variant of democracy works, and uh, it's not exactly like the states or not exactly like the British television series. I wanted to get across a bit of the, you know, the Canadian variant of democracy and uh, how it works and uh, what, what those people that we choose uh, that will be sworn in, uh, I gather, next week, uh, you know, will be doing for the next few years. And we are happy to remind people that it's called Governing Canada, a guide to the tradecraft of politics. And it's brought Michael Wernick to our studio virtually from the nation's capital. Michael Wernick, thanks for joining us tonight on TVO. Thanks, thanks Steve, and thank you for your interest. That is the agenda for Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Tomorrow, in his first one-on-one -on -one interview since the election, Federal Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole will be here on Next Steps after a disappointing showing in the election. Also, we'll assess the current state of the global economy. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.